Okay, so this is a pretty darn interesting video to record. And I've set the slides to roughly three minutes a slide, but I think I'm going to be playing fast and loose with that. So Stalin gets his dream battleship, battlecruiser fleet. What is the NATO to Western Iris response? And the thing, Ruhon, about this question is... Once you included the Western Allies as a group, you made it ultimately slightly more difficult for me. Because I have to start thinking about a lot more than just the NATO response post-World War II. And the fleet post-World War II. And there is quite a massive fleet to be considered. In fact, there's, there's basically... Okay. Traditionally... And he says traditionally whilst grabbing the book, which he used as a bit of a Bible for this. This lovely work, uh, Stalin's Ocean Going Fleet by Jürgen Rohr and Mikhail S. Monokov. Uh, this is a very, very good book. It's well worth reading, as you can see. Mine is incredibly well thumbed. I have spent a lot of time going through this. I know it more or better than I really should. I've combined that with a few other books, including... Of course, Gorshkov, reading for this one. And, um, this very interesting thing I got from Amazon, which is, um, rather an interesting one. It's, uh, let's put it this way. It's literally a stats book, and I'm tempted to say it's been adapted from various sections of the internet. But... I'd also say, Navypedia reference, it didn't cost me that much, and it's very, fairly useful to have as it explains everything fairly decently. And it might have, I can put down the similarities to the internet, certain portions of the internet as maybe they copied from it. It's almost a possibility. It's always a possibility. But still, Stalin gets his dream fleet. Stalin gets his dream fleet? Well, that's the first thing. Which dream fleet is it? And what is the NATO Westernized response? Now, this is a this is an interesting one. This is a very interesting one. And I could... I worked out very quickly. If I did this, I could either do it so it'd be about four hours... Four, five, six hours long. Or I could do it so it's roughly going to be probably about an hour long. And I decided to go with the hour version for two reasons. One... I might well decide to return and do further videos on this uh, this idea at various points because it'd be interesting to burrow down into what the exact particular permutations might have been. And secondly, I decided to make an hour long because I'm recording this on the 27th of May. And that means that yesterday, the Stalingrad class battlecruiser video went up and went live. And I've been seeing the comments on that. And I decided that if I did a longer one, I would have so many comments pinging through on my poor phone on the 8th of June during the live, wherever I was, whatever time it was with me when this goes as, well, it won't be live, of course, when it goes as a premiere, that my poor phone might die. Because there have been a lot of comments on it. And various people trying to work out what the exact response to this, the just the battle cruisers being built, let alone anything else, just the Stalingrad class battle cruisers. And they're pretty darn pretty ships, but they're not the be all and end all. They are certainly not the be all and end all. In fact, they're nowhere near the be all and end all. But they're interesting. Shameless book plug. Thank you to everyone who's already bought copies. Thank you to everyone who keeps ordering more, who's ordering copies. Thank you to everyone who's written reviews and all the other things of it. It's thank you. Um, someone asked me, "They what's my dream of the for the book?" Uh, because I said it's you know got a second edition coming through of it. So sure, don't must be dream. I said uh, my response was well. I don't think I'm ever going to be, be, be able to sell enough copies to reach the bestseller list or anything like that. And I don't think I've managed to qualify for any of the potential awards uh, because it's about destroyers in World War II and frankly that's 
not going to get an award, probably, at this point. Not, th not this book. It's too... This is their history. This is what they did, and this is their value. Not, this is... An emo uh, well, it was an emotional story, an emo emotional piece of history for me to write, but um, I, I'm not sure if it's necessarily the ne level of emotional connection you'd want. And I don't think it's going to get turn as an in uh, turn out to be an inspiration for a Band of Brothers style remake about British destroyers in World War Two. I'd love it to be. I would love it to be. I could have a feeling that someone from a modern television company would absolutely hate the nicknames the sailors give each other in the spirit. I remember once the amount of flashes I got on YouTube when I re mentioned the name that the nickname which one of the uh, the sailors had on the ship, and that that in a video a long, long time ago. It's a case of they were definitely not politically correct by today's standards in their nicknaming of each other. They really weren't. So I don't think that's going to happen, I suppose. Okay, if I saw people citing it on Wikipedia, that'd be pretty cool. Because that would mean I'd be being cited alongside the likes of Norman Freeman, etc. I suppose that, that, that's sort of the the next thing I'd, I, I suppose I'd have to look for, but... Yeah, I wouldn't want... I, I, I would, I'd like that to happen organically, though, if that makes sense. You know, there's, there's, there's times I, I, I read things and I go, Ooh, what if they cite as a reference for that? And I go, oh, not my book. Okay. But they found it in that, in that text. Oh, that's good. So they found it... And they found a link there in that source, which I did too. But then, of course, I went to the primary source from that. And then I went and so I put both in my bibliography, of course, because that's what you do. And then sort of went to sort of the primary source and went, how did the Navy actually phase this when they did this? It was interesting. Anyway, to the Soviets, to the Soviets of this period. So, first thing, all right, uh, project in Soviet is spelled P-R-O-J-E-K-T. So, please, no one start telling me I'm spelling project wrong. I know, it's not how we normally spell it, but it's how it's spelt when they do it. So, I've gone accurately, as much as spell check will allow me, if I keep complaining. That picture, by the way, comes from this book. This, that, is the Soviet nail rod. 30 knots of speed. Twelve six-inch guns. Nine sixteen-inch guns. Twelve four-inch guns. Thirty-six, thirty-seven millimeter guns. I think in nine quadruple mounts, but it changes sometimes in the suspicion that they, they say. And maximum speed, 30 knots, was the aim for 35,000 tons. I'm not quite sure they'd have got that, but I think it would have been, it's a very interesting vessel. And one of the things I would say this, if the Soviet Union had laid that down in 1920, 1935, at the pace of construction of at least the Svetsi Soyuz and other vessels in their period. I have no doubt that at least the one in the Baltic, possibly even the one they were planning for the Black Sea, could have been launched. These were far smaller than some of the, the Project 29 ships. They were far less complicated in many regards than the Project 29 ships. And I think they could have been launched and built. And I think you could then have had a very, very interesting scenario. Especially before war began. Because Germany invades the Soviet Union in June 1941. These ships, if laid down, let's say in June 1935, would probably have taken about four to five years to be built and commissioned. 
and other Soviet units. So I'm not exactly making them build them at a massive pace right now. This is a lot smaller also than a Project 29. And yet they could have been finished. Two of them, maybe even three. Now the question is, you can ask me, well, Alex, do they have the uh, do they have the facilities to sustain and maintain these vessels? Well, I would argue they could well have built the facilities to sustain and maintain these vessels, and they have a lot more ability to sustain and maintain these vessels than some of the other designs looked at. I think for me, Project Twenty One is well. How do I put this politely? Uh, far more likely to be able to be sustained than Project 29. Project 29 is the Sovetsky Soyuz class. And if we consider for a, star a starting point, they were to, supposed to be, in terms of standard displacement, 59,150 tons. So that's near enough, makes no difference. Uh, about 25,000 tons more. Well, 24,000 tons. Let's be generous. Let's be nice. And their length was going to be 270 meters overall, pretty much. Their beam was going to be about 39 meters overall, draft of 10.4 meters. And, well, they're going to have six of the latest boiler types. 1,000 shaft horsepower, and apparently be able to go three shafts with three gears, steam turbines, getting up to 28 knots. Now, I don't think this thing would have got to 30 knots. I don't think so. I think 28 knots is more is more likely. But I also think it could have been built, and I think it could have been in service, and I think they could have completed that within the time allotted. So, again, Project 21, if they'd gone with it, could have been built in that time. And the point would be this, if they'd gone with Project 21, and they'd gone with what I'll be talking about, the fleeted second five-year plan, which they actually laid in wait for the Project 29 to come through, then I think Stalin gets his battle fleet. And that's going to be an interesting thing. If Stalin's got a battle fleet, how does that change things? How does that change things? If Stalin has fast battleships. Let's be honest, let's think about surface raiders. Even if you include everything else in World War II happens as it, did, as it previously did, how does that change things? Do the Germans even build the Scharnhorst class with 11-inch guns if he's got a fleet of brand new ships with 16-inch guns? And yes, please note, you can point out to me and go, Alex, well, what about the development problems of a 16-inch gun? What about all those issues? You are completely right. But if anyone would send a ship to sea with just 16-inch guns, which should work in theory, but not work in reality, it's this guy and the Soviet Union. I'm sorry. So it will look like it works. It might not actually work. They might be absolutely the most terrible things since NF anywhere. They wouldn't trust anything. But they'd exist. They'd exist. And that's ultimately the big problem with Stalin getting any of these fleets. Once they exist, you can't ignore them. Some was um, one of the common response on the Stalingrad comments. And you go through and read them, please do. Is the amount of people telling me how they would destroy these ships. You know, they would use... Uh, missiles from aircraft and all these things. Well, missiles were coming through. They weren't quite in service when they're being built and cancelled, but they, they, there is a time and capability coming. I, I do recommend them. I, reckon, I recognise that. But the fact is, you're probably going to have to respond with some kind of large cruiser or battle cruiser type vessel, perhaps. Uh, mainly from the point of view of whilst missiles might kill them, uh, armed forces aren't in the possible uh, in the aren't in the realms of might kill them. They want something that definitely will kill them. So what I could see you doing is seeing a couple of a, a, a few large cruisers, battle cruisers, whatever you want to call them at that point. Um, near enough, they'd be near enough between the smudging of the lines that would make no difference. Being built, 
and they would be the last generation. Okay, but it would be basically, those would be in service until they were sure the missiles would work. They might even stay in service longer than that. And I say that because they could well find themselves being useful for a lot of other duties, especially in President's duties. In terms of, do you want your aircraft carrier to go and sit in a harbour next to this one's battlecruisers? No, you don't. So, you probably not. You probably send one of your own battlecruisers to turn up in harbour. And it'd be a force modification, presence modification vessel. Large escort, large, uh, or, uh, uh, large sort of vessel doing that role. The difference I think you'd see is I doubt you'd... S uh, for the Americans, it would be an honest question as to what, whether to just reactivate the Alaskas or not. Um, I think they might go with the Alaskas over the hours, but I'm not 100% sure. They might decide it's good the hours. I think for the Royal Navy, it would probably be short-term would be Vanguard for the, just the Stalingrad class, but we'll get into that, and we'll get into all that. I think for other navies, it becomes more complicated. The French do actually have uh, a couple of battleships wandering around, fast battleships, so they would probably sort of work on those. Uh, it would be an interesting scenario. But we'll get into all this. The point is, data being available. And here are the three sort of options you can get in the three periods. The fleet of the second five-year plan, the fleet of the third five-year plan, which is where you get an official fleet organization. The second, what comes on the second five-year plan is pretty much the start of Project 21 and pro, what leads to Project 29 and Project 29 being constructed. It starts under the second year plan, five-year plan, but is theoretically all done on the third five-year plan. It's fun! And then the post-World War II fleet. Stalin doesn't give up easy. Doesn't give up easy. In fact, wouldn't give up if he had any chance. So, now, four later eight Type A Project 23 units. Again, they're st they're p the, the Sovetsi Soyuz, they are laid down. And it's worthwhile thinking about this. They are laid down in 1938. Although, generally, uh, July 1930 is officially when I lay down, but construction actually begins in January 1939, because it takes that time for a slipway to be completed. Because, again, she requires a longer slipway. Again, this is where if you start the other one off, if you go Project 21, the smaller design, the cheap, easier design, etc., you can get these things all started a lot quicker, and it would have probably been started off at least three, if not four years earlier. That's why I say could well have been done. And it's worthwhile considering in this picture that it's not just, and this is an important picture because this is from June 1941, this picture. That's the cru uh, cruiser, the Shuklov, under construction. Here. This is an attempt to build a fleet. They're ordering for later eight Type A Project 23 units of, at this point, 41,500 tons with, uh, in standard and nine 406mm 16-inch uh, guns. They grow dramatically. This is another reason, you know, this is the interesting thing to Soviet is what starts out as a 41,500 ton design in this period goes up to... By the time you're in the second, by the time you're in the and the third in third five year plan into oh, it's being actually being laid laid down to a fifty eight thousand or something ton vessel. So the thing is, this is the plan, but it's not laid down until the third five year plan. But the plan in the second five year is four. And again, this is where the <laughs> project twenty one. Four later sixteen type B project twenty five units of. 26,300 tons with nine 12-inch guns. Let's be honest. If Russia really was building 24 battleships, eight 16-inch ships and 16 12-inch gunships, that would be a significant world-altering event. You know, we can all sit here and go, they couldn't really build that. Well, in the nicest way, there are people who discuss Plan Z as if the Germans could actually build that. 
Realistically here, I think churning out four and four is more likely of these options. And that was the original plan. 20 cruisers, 17 destroyer leaders, 182 destroyers, and 244 submarines. The thing is, they could have done that. This brings us to the question of likely completion. Well, you see again, if we go back to the second five-year plan and we start off in 36, 37, instead of starting in 38, 39, You can do a lot. You can do a lot. But you have to be realistic. Honestly, I think it's an interesting scenario if the world doesn't go to war in 1939. Because the longer it goes on, the more likely more powers are going to enter the theatre with more and more firepower. Which could be interesting. Could the Soviet Union complete it? Yes, they could complete something. They were actually building them. How long it would take them is an interesting, interesting thing. I think if you don't have the interruption of World War II, I do think you have them completed. I think if you'd started on the Project 21 ships in 1935-36, they would have been in service, at least two of them, by the time war began. There also might have been two more not far off completion. In which case... The German Navy could have, the Kriegsmarine could have found themselves in some very, very tight water maneuvers. Because if we go back to the Project 21 design, that's not going to be a nice thing for them to fight in the Baltic. And yes, some will probably respond here by it and go, well, the German air power. Well, yes, the German air power will be very capable. But the Soviet air power was no slouch. And is going to be just as present. And that becomes a problem. And in the Black Sea, that could be a real problem for the Germans because they do not have any ship of equivalent, uh, equivalent size and scale. And if you have these in the North Atlantic, again, not impossible, then suddenly you have a scenario whereby the... British capital ships could be escorting a convoy a certain distance, and then the Soviet capital ships take over the rest of the way. As they basically have tried to achieve with a... Uh, the the um, application of a R-class battleship from the British to assist the Soviet Union. That would have been possible from the get-go, the beginning. Think about all the scenarios that could change. Convoy, scatter. Why scatter? Oh, Turpitz is out. Well, then it'll run into this. And yes, it might... It, Turpitz might well win. But it might not. And whatever happens, it's going to get damaged. The odds are it's going to get damaged. And 16-inch guns, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't... Once you're getting hit by 16-inch shells... It doesn't matter how great they are, they're going to cause damage just by their sheer appearance in your hull. It's not a nice experience. They're big enough, nasty enough, they cause the trouble just all of their own, just by virtue of being a 16-inch shell, as long as they come vaguely near you. So, that's not good. But it's good for the Allied effort at that point. The wider fleet being produced, I think that's going to be more interesting. And this is the reason I chose these two photos to give you is because these two pictures show her June 1941, June 1942, after war has begun. And in this point, the cruiser is still down there. 
There is still a Chapeyev class cruiser under construction there. Cruiser and her both look stalled in place. But that's after a year of war. They don't, they've done some work. Some work has been done. Definitely some work has been done. But not a lot. Not a lot of work. War has that effect on people. So, if they are completed, and I think it's far more likely the 4 and 4 is completed than the 8 and 16, well, at that point, the rest of the world's reaction gets interesting. Because you don't have Especially if they start off early with the Project 21 ships. But even without starting off earlier with these ships. If you have war doesn't start and they get completed before war begin, breaks out. You have their very closing nearing completion reason for a Japanese build-up. After all, Russo-Japanese war and disputed territories between Russia and Japan. Or any part of it. You have British... Needing to protect themselves because of Russian interest, uh, Soviet Union's interest in India, etc. Yeah, British will want to build up. Germany will be able to justify their build up because Soviet Union, hasty. Um, basically, the thing is, the Soviet Union wasn't included in any of the naval treaties because it was viewed as too difficult politically to get them involved. And kind of like Germany, what was the point? They didn't weren't able to build anything. Unfortunately, them building this stuff after the treaty system has broken down means that there is no restraint at all on anyone. And they would have provided a justification for ignoring the treaties as it was. Because it could have triggered the escalator clause for pretty much everyone. Especially when you consider the weight of the Project 29s as they laid them down. So basically, the world's reaction is a lot of these ships get built. I mean, vanguards get hurried up and Iowa's get hurried up. These sexy beasts are going to be multiplied. Because that's your response. It's, again, you have to balance your response, okay? It's very easy for us in hindsight to go, what you need to do is build aircraft carriers. Because in a few years, they're going to have the long-range strike capability that if enough aircraft manage to find a, a battleship and it's unsupported, and it's got not going to carry to provide any protection of itself, etc., all these things, things part of the uh, you can probably take it out without too much trouble. And uh, you'll lose a few aircraft, but that's nothing compared to losing a ship. And um, yeah, you'll do that. You, we can know that because we can see, looking back, what happens in the future. You're dealing with it at a time, and you haven't seen that. You can go, well, aircraft in theory could work, but that thing I know does work. So what do you do? Do you take the risk... Of going for just aircraft. Do you take the risk of just going for the thing you know which works? Or do you balance the risk by going for the thing which you know definitely works. And also investing in the thing which will probably work in the future. You're a navy. You're for a major power. You're going to do the latter option aren't you. That's what you're going to do. Because that's a sensible thing to do. So third five year plan. What are we talking about? Well, fleet planned for 1945 and 1938 was 21 battleships, all to be Project 23 ships, a single aircraft carrier, eight heavy cruisers, two coastal defense ships, 21 light cruisers, 132 destroyers and torpedo boats, and 289 submarines. And by the way, all these stats come from that lovely book, the Yogan Roa one. That's a light aircraft carrier planned. Project 71. The fleet planned as in August 1939 for 1947. Slightly bigger. 15 Project 23 battleships. 
10 Project 69 Battle. Hmm. Kronstadt. They are some really big, mean things. I tend to focus in on the Stalingrad ones, because they're actually the ones which get closest to being completed. But it's worthwhile considering the Kronstadt. Two aircraft carriers, the Project 71s. Point two. 31 cruisers. Project 68, get in a lot of them in, but also some Project 26s. Destroyer leaders. Destroyers. Patrol ships. Minesweepers, sub chasers, motor torpedo boats, big submarines, medium submarines, small submarines. That's a lot of ships. And the point is this Stalin isn't talking about building battleships, he's building a fleet. Yes, battleships are part of that fleet, a core part of that fleet, but they're a core part of everyone's fleet at this time. It's the sensible approach to have them as a core part of your fleet, because they are the big, pounding thing you know works. Again, stop expecting, please, when people, uh, this is one of the things I do love about accommodating some people when they look back at history. They expect the people in 1939 to know we, what we know about 1948 when they're in 1939. They don't. We do. Because we're in 2023. It works. But in this period, it's very sensible doing this. It's even very sensible doing this in the period into the 1950s. Because whilst missiles are coming, whilst all that stuff is coming, it's still its infancy, it's still being developed. And it's still... got limitations. One of the other videos is going to be in the series. It's going to be the 22nd of June, which is going to be the Western Approach Static Unit. And one of the great things is that is there is a whole system of tactic developed for how to confuse German homing torpedoes. How to confuse them. And you sit there and look at that tactic and go, Oh frigate, this worked. And we know it worked. Because ships used it and survived. And the whole idea of Early homing torpedo equals guaranteed kill of enemy ship. It's therefore a war-winning weapon. Is completely blown up when you realise that their method of dealing with it is to steam at full power at the submarine for two minutes and then do a 60 degree turn either to port or starboard, steam for three minutes, then turn back towards the submarine. Because that will get them out of the seeker cone of the torpedo. And force the submarine to either fire another one or dive. And this is if they're on a surface. Even if they're subsurface, they have to dive lower to try and avoid them. Either way, it makes it far easier for their sonar and for them to tracking for the escort to track and kill them. And you go through the results and you find out that of the 30, 40 recorded attacks, the vast majority managed to avoid. In, that's in a certain period, using this tactic. And then you think about early missiles. And yes, they are capable things for their period. And there is the emphasis there for their period. They're not the missiles like we have today, they're the missiles of their time. They still have issues. And whilst they can be devastating if they work, you they are less than reliable than these. The guns on the Kronstadt class. Again, started. The Project 69 Battlecruisers. These are truly scary beasts. They really are. They are the example of... Oh, right. So... You decided you wanted to just go for big. They're designed around being 32 knots. They're designed around six 15-inch guns. Again, I would like to point out that whoever was designing this fleet really hated logisticians. I mean, I am fairly certain that Stalin and whoever designed this fleet 
should join the group of list of people that includes Rommel, includes, to an extent, Montgomery, most definitely includes our old favourite, Douglas MacArthur, as in groups of people who believe that logistics is something that happens to other people. And I would also say whoever was quite a... Whilst I, I, I do have great respect for him and the ships he built, Admiral Henderson, uh, Third Sea Lord, did nothing to do... Uh, uh, was constantly trying to push designs through and failed dramatically in one area where he really did feel was to try and standardise British guns prior to World War Two, which explains why the Royal Navy also, for who are also a navy for whom logistics to some extent happens to other people. Although, this is mostly felt by the fact, let's be honest, Chatfield pushed through the 14-inch guns on the King George V's when Henderson was hoping for 15-inch guns, which would have confirmed that. And then you've had 5.25, 4.7-inch, and 4.5-inch, and 4-inch all within those sort of Gun realms. Um, yeah, it would have been that made like, and 5.5 inch also was going around, I think, some place, in place, some places. Yeah, th there's, there's a lot of, and uh, on top of that, of course, 6 inch. So, um, a lot of various light gun rounds which could have been standardized, could, should have been standardized. But still, but still, logistics is something which happens to other people, is. Is a result I often think of seeking engineeringly perfect solutions for problems. Because it means you're after the perfect solution for your problem, not necessarily uh, not, not, not necessarily the perfect solution for the problem in the context of your fleet or your logistical situation. And the likely result of this fleet? If war had of course not broken out this is the point i will always make because it's if war doesn't if war breaks out then things happen and that fleet doesn't get completed uh, because the Soviet union gets invaded almost invariably when you work for the results uh, the results because hitler's built a machine which is predicated by that point and it survives on continual acquisition of territory, resources, and labor to finance itself. So, presuming, uh, assuming that they never managed to actually crack the formula of Operation Sea Line, which would be a lot more resources, and actually being able to destroy the Royal Navy, you're left with the scenario that is, you will always get the Soviet Union invaded. But if you don't have war, and you do have some construction going on, the odds are the likely result is pro uh, the uh, lion <laughs> glass uh, get built. Um, that's fairly standard. And this is, of course, an audacious class aircraft carrier. And again, they get built because the thing is, it's not the Soviet naval force, even if they do manage to build all those things, that is really going to have the big impact on the Royal Navy's plans. Yes, they'll want to strengthen the home fleet, but to be honest, they're not going to be too worried about the North Atlantic and Baltic fleets. They can probably keep an eye on them. The Black Sea fleet's going to be a problem, but there again, the Royal Navy controls the Suez Canal in Gibraltar, so good luck at getting anywhere if they want to stop it. And nextly after that, you have the Pacific fleet, which will have to deal with, which will probably be annoying Japan. But that's where it does cause problems, because the very existence of this Soviet Navy is going to cause a massive build-up of Japan, of Germany, which is going to cause consequential reactions of France, and then, of course, Italy, as well, of course, reactions from America, which is going to require reactions from Britain. Basically, the moment there is such a large power, uh, power building up a large navy, even if they don't build this whole force, and, and in terms of viable proposal, I do not consider this whole force being constructed by 1947. Although I do like the fact that it's, you know, it's slightly more sensible than some other scenarios that are being put forward by other powers. It, this is not possible to be constructed by 1947. I would say you might get the aircraft carriers done. 
mainly because of novelty. I would say in terms of capital ships, you'd be lucky to get 10 of the Project 23 ships finished. More likely it would be 6. And you'd probably get 3 at most of the 69, Project 69 battlecruisers finished. If you'd had all those 8 years. Because of the way their industrialization process is going, because of the way the reality of their yards and the actual likely construction team at the times. But still, that's going to cause a reaction. That's going to cause the Japanese to react. That's going to cause, which will cause the Americans to react. And as I said, it's going to cause the Germans to react, which will cause the French to react. And it's going to cause everyone to react because of the changing scales of the balance factor. So, now we're into the post-World War II fleet 10-year program started in 1945. Now, here is an interesting scenario because... What does this starting look like? This is starting to look like a sea power fleet and a global reach fleet, but also a maritime security and national security fleet. It's 4,356 ships, of which you could argue... Okay, yes, you have submarines on this side, but taking the submarines from this side and sticking them over here, and taking the gunboat patrol ships from over here and sticking them over here, the vast preponderance of vessels are on this side are defensive. I know they have landing vessels. They do. But they are part of strategic mobility and a key part of strategic mobility if you're looking in certain regions, i.e. the Black Sea, i.e. the Baltic and the Scandinavian regions. So they're a key part of their mobility. But leaving that all to one side, on the other side, you do have nine battleships. You do have 12 battlecruisers. You do have 30 heavy cruisers. You do have 60 light cruisers. You have nine big carriers, six light carriers. The big carriers can also be translated as bit of fleet carriers, etc. So they are the larger vessels. And you have 18 big monitors. Now this is because quite a lot of the seagoing gunboats and even some of the patrol ships are variations on monitors design and the monitors they've used in World War II. So they're definitely part of that. And then you have 144 big destroyers, which are basically ocean going destroyers. And literals slash maybe you could uh, you could argue their task group which are vessels destroyers, big sub chasers, big submarines, medium submarines, small submarines. It's a developed force, and if you have had this pairing by 1955, there would be a lot of problems. There would be. You can. Let's put, if Russia comes out of World War II in 1945, lays down the, starts building them at a pace, and you have three of those battleships, and let's say, let's say they divide that tenure up, they divide it, those 21 ships over that ten years to, they're going to be launching them at a pace of every two years to be, com to be completed in time. And they're going to be sort of launching them and commissioning them as they get sort of them ready. So, basically, you've got to divide that 21 up by 5, which gives you roughly 4 four or 5 units. You start off with 5 in your first group, 3 battleships and 2 battlecruisers. You build them first and fast. Battlecruisers are now mostly the Stalingrad class, which are the smaller, lighter ones. Uh, the Kronstadt class is still around. So are the Project 29. Uh, the Project 23s are now providing the nine battleships. The Kronstadts are providing roughly eight of the battle crews, it seems, roughly. And then the rest are Stalingrads that's looking at. If you've got that a scenario, that being built, and if you get those ships entering service, let's say you get three Project 29, 23, uh, three Project um, 23 battleships are built. Oh, no, they're Project 29, aren't they? Yeah, 20... No, they are. Project 23. 23 battleships are built, and... A Stalingrad and a Kronstadt class are built. And launched by 1947. Commissioned 1949. 
at the same time as another four vessels. Uh, let's say this time one Project 23 battleship and one Kronstadt and two Stalingrad class are being are being are being are being launched. What do you do as a major power? What do you do as Britain in 1949? What do you do as America in 1949? The idea of Britain in 1949 going, we're ceding the world to America, so this is just their problem, we're not going to build anything as can, doesn't really wash. I think the idea that the Maltas will have been got rid of at this point, probably not. Honestly... I could see the Maltas, which, as it was, are cancelled in October and December 1945, would probably have been, especially if the these were laid down early enough in 1945, would not have been cancelled. They might have been slow built. They might even have been, and this is going to sound terrible, they might have even been semi mothballed in construction sort of just left so they could uh, done to the point at which they could be launched and so they can be le and then they can be left somewhere quietly that you can finish them off if you need to it's a very sensible system to do but i would argue that's what you would uh, that a uh, power and may, britain might well do that sort of scenario And this would create an interesting scenario, definitely. Because I think you'd have a lot of nations would be doing that based on what is the likely production rate. Could the Soviet Union have done that, by the way? Could they have done such a pace of construction? Well, not easily, but it's also not impossible. If Stalin has more energy... And if Stalin is able to, is really committed to it and brings his people behind him, because let's be honest, they, well, rather pushes them in front of him because he doesn't trust them standing behind him, and none of them would really want to try and stab old, the uh, grandfather and Joe in the back, they will push it on. At which point you have to respond. NATO's not formed originally till 1949. So NATO could be formed literally as part of a response to that group. Which might mean, it's going to sound strange, NATO could have enshrined in its articles certain naval commitments. You might see Britain sign up to maintain a minimum number of carrier battle groups. And those carrier battle groups might have to have a large surface escort. I could certainly see the scenario that Anson Howe Vanguard last a fair amount longer. You might even have the Duke of York and possibly King George V last longer in Royal Navy service. Because... Yeah! You might well be sitting there going, but surely, Alex, World War II has shown that aircraft can destroy battleships. Surely, the Royal Navy's own experience of the loss of Repulse and Prince of Wales shows that aircraft can destroy battleships. Quite true. But the Royal Navy's also experience on the Mediterranean, where Nelson and Rodney were damaged, but weren't destroyed and were operating with carrier cover and were very useful assets as carrier cover because they often had to fight off other battleships, etc., which were operating under their own air cover. I, If you're operating under neutral, anything less than sort of 
anything less than and if you're operating in scenarios where you, where one side where either side has anything less than complete control of the air battleships can still have a lot of power and still be useful well, if you're thinking about that and British experience of Force H, etc., where they were operating their carriers, their fast car their carriers were fast battleship, fast escort, you've got to sit there and think that the Royal Navy are going to push that policy again, as is the US Navy. If you're going to be deploying carrier hunter groups around the world, they're going to want to have a large fast escort with them. And that's going to be a really interesting scenario. The Soviet Union pushes and builds an actual major fleet as early as after World War II. Let alone before, it has a ripple effect. It makes the North Atlantic Treaty Alliance even more about the North Atlantic. Because control of it and control of global trade is going to be far more important. Because one of the things is when NATO is formed, and one of the reasons why Britain gets so obsessed with the British Army of the Rhine and various other powers do go back to troops in Germany, it's because the Soviet Union doesn't have global forces. They don't have that global reach. So that's how you show your capabilities and power and alliance. But if the Soviet Union starts off with building up a larger navy, then suddenly, for Britain, the traditional methodology of having a large navy, not the World War I system, which had come about, but the traditional methodology of Corbettian system, you can argue, of relying on having a naval power, a naval power base, could well be the dominant factor. For America, what do they do? Do they keep building midways? Do they build and improve midway? As a response, do they build? I. The question is really is I don't think necessarily the Montanas as powerful as they were going to be would necessarily be the answer. I would say probably another another generation of fast battleship like the Iowas, or possibly they go for an improved version of the of the Alaskas. And I would say at that point and please note with what I'm saying here, there is a possibility that both America and Britain end up going down the large, powerful cruiser route as their major escort that succeeds that generation of battleships. They could well decide that the Soviet Union might want whole battleships, etc., but they're just looking for something powerful enough that it can buy time for their carrier to get away or launch a strike if there are situations where it's getting too close. They don't need to go for something which can meet it as an equal on the, fl on the on the battlefield. They might do. There again, they might not. They might go for, we want something which has total dominance. There are arguments either way. And that's, that's part of the reasons why I like looking at this sort of question, this sort of alternate history answer. What does it do? And that's why I said there's an hour version or there's a six hour version. Six hour version is me going to every permutation and giving you what I would think. What I'm hoping the hour version does is it gives you a lot to think about and go and think about through the history. Because there's a history as it happened. But as I often remind people, because history happened a certain way doesn't mean that's the A, the only way it could have turned out, and B, what it was most likely to turn out. good example of that is the Battle of Midway, which is another video that I'll be doing and discussing in this series while I'm away. The fleets of Midway, building fleets of Midway is the 20th of June. Midway doesn't, by rights, when you run it in Harpoon or any of the simulation systems, got command, uh, command at the recent conference I went to, and that's a very cool software, piece of software, and it's the, you know, Command Modern Operations. Well, all the various versions of this, if you run Midway in it, Midway doesn't turn out like Midway turned out a lot of the time. In fact, it's kind of rare. There's luck involved there. There's chance. There's mistakes on both sides. 
What does that mean? Well, this means that it's important to examine all the possible permutations of history to learn the full lessons of why did that happen. So, with this history, when you're looking at the potential options for a Soviet fleet, and really the question for this entire video, what I would love people to answer in their comments today, they've written this the whole way through to the end, is this. Say the Soviet Union built at each of those periods, and I would like to retcon in the Project 21, because that could actually be done in time, for the second. So let's say they built four of the Project 21 battleships. They do build four of them. And then after that, they decide they're going to shift to the Project 23s for the third, uh, 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 the, you know, the uh, third five-year plan, and then war breaks out anyway. How does that affect things? How does four Soviet Union gaining four brand new battleships affect the world? How does it affect the world? Because it's going to have an impact on it. Let's be honest. If you're the German Navy and the Soviet Union has that as well as a Gangut wandering around the Baltic, suddenly you have to worry about your forces in the Baltic. Because what do you have to match in against them? The, uh, the Scharnhorst class? They've got 11-inch guns. Nine of them. And that's got nine 16-inch guns. That's basically a Scharnhorst hunter. And it's fast enough. It's 28 knots. Again, in the Baltic, yes, they can go 31, 32 knots. Yes, they can go faster. But if it can do 28 knots, that's enough. That is enough that it's probably going to be able to catch them. Because the odds are you're poodling around at your cruising speed. If they come over the horizon at full speed, they can catch you. So, as you can see from this, there have been issues. There, It's gone blank. And I'm now reorganizing Perth. And that's... That's the joys of organizing, organizing these trips and long range and you... So many emails going backwards and forwards, and so at the time taken to respond. In fact, emails sometimes I will send an email. Basically, it's an email a day going each way because of the time differentials, and occasionally staying up late and talking to people on the phone. And sometimes you have something organized, you think it's going to be there, and then for perfectly understandable, perfectly good reasons, life changes and you adapt. So Perth, the targets are going to change. We're still hoping to make to Albany. We're still having to go with things. But those details, the dates, etc., are going are now in flux. It's a week to go. It's a week to go before we get over there. Well, I'm there, and in a week's time, the rest of the team leaves a week tomorrow. Um, yeah, it'll be sorted out. Perth will be fine by the time everyone gets there, and by the time we're announcing this all. And yes, we do like to have it dealt with earlier, but. <sighs> Life happens. I can make some announcements. It's like I can tell you that the Brisbane, in Brisbane, the pub that where we're going to have dinner is the uh, Ship Inn. Now I will say this: Thank you, Queens uh, Queen, uh, Queen, uh, Queensland uh, Maritime Museum, because those lovely people they have been helping us organise this. And they came for a suggestion. They said, "Well, this uh, this hotel is a very nice restaurant, and they they can commute to sort people out. And this restaurant is very good, and they can sort people out. Or there's this pub, which used to be the place for sailors to go and get drunk, but is now a respectable place. And it's a case of place where sailors used to get drunk. We don't care what the menu is. We're going there." <laughs> <laughs> and are we sure it still has to be respectable because we're going to be there and we can make things less respectable very quickly but anyway that's that's the joy of life and as said this video is going to be about an hour long so <sighs> let's see what else we've got coming up uh, we've got a lot of videos coming up this one's hopefully the fleets of the Imperium Warhammer 40k have come out I have literally while I'm recording this just been told that for some reason the sound has gone Weird on a video I loaded up weeks ago and was fine when last I checked through it. So goodness knows what's happened with that one. Ah, the joys of life. Anyway, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I will check the sound on this and all the other videos before they go up. But I will apologize in advance. They're being loaded up. 
their sound I check and I hope it before it gets loaded up and I hope it's okay when it's on up on the YouTube but uh, issues do happen thank you very much for watching and take care What's happened to that?